Hey there, Far Travelers, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and today I got a plain little intro on Intro to the Plains, where we're going to take you to heaven and hell and back again and show you all the elements to walk these plains on WebDM. This week's sponsor is Hero Forge. They are the masters of customizable miniatures and they're letting us give y'all a Black Friday deal. From now through December 2nd, 2019, use the code WebDMHOLIDAY at HeroForge.com and get $5 off your first custom mini. You can choose from thousands of options to design your figures in full 3D precisely to your specifications. They'll print them out in high quality plastic or metal and send them straight to you. Or download the files and create them on your own 3D printer. Those are all $3.99 through December 2nd with no no code needed, by the way. Visit HeroForge.com to start designing today and check back often. New content is available every week. Link in the comments and description. All right, Jim. Let's uh, let's get uh, philosophical as well as uh, uh, inspirational. What are the planes? Like, what the hell is a plane? Where is it? What is it? How is it? Why yeah. is a plane? I don't know. They're, it's a weird concept because it comes from, obviously, there's concepts of other worlds and mm -hmm. spirit worlds and mirror worlds and the like that come from a variety of uh, you know, folklore and mythical traditions, things like that. But the specific iteration of planes in Dungeons and Dragons, the theosophical movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries had some interesting ideas about uh, where people get knowledge from, mm -hmm. uh, souls, how people are born, and, yes. and sort of higher orders of sight, right? Sort of blessed by a, a divine <laughs> muse or whatever. Yeah, you can see the transition if you uh, if you look at uh, spells like contact other plane in uh, like original D and D and mm -hmm. and the way that they structure the planes, uh, you know, through that spell. Uh, and then by the time you get to first edition, you've got the grid of uh, you know this is the Mount Celestia and yeah, yeah. nine hells of um, you know at the time. It's just like hell. It's very much in D&D, it's very much a kind of a, a modern sort of concept of higher orders of consciousness, hence astral projection, things like that. But also it needs to be a place that you can physically go to because it needs to be a place that you can adventure. Yeah. And so where the like the real world esoteric traditions, these are states of mind, states of being. You enter into them through, you know, meditation or drug use or something. I don't know. Uh, ecstatic visions yeah. and <laughs> get lifted, right? Which is fun to import, but you know, sort of back import into your D and D games. But it does sort of have this because it has this tension between dimensions or, or places where your your consciousness resides on a higher level, your subtle body, as it were. But also, you also have to go there in adventure. You have to be able to swing a sword, cast a spell, climb a rock, jump mm -hmm. around. Uh, I do find that there's a tension in in D and D's con concept of uh, planar travel, everything. And you can exploit that tension for, uh, you know, adventure ideas and, and the like. I, I think Planescape tried to grapple with it and mm -hmm. came the closest to really, like, taking it seriously, but uh, also had some flaws uh, in execution, so. What are some ways you can arrange this this, this jumble of, of cosmologies, <laughs> you know? Like, where do characters go when they die? Like, DMs should have a... a and a general understanding uh, of the planes, but they don't need to have like an intricate model or something. And if they want, they can borrow one of the many that have sort of um, sprung up over D&D &D as, you know, as it's uh, existed. And I think the biggest one and the one that uh, is sort of official for fifth edition is what's known as the Great Wheel. While the fifth has changed it somewhat, especially the number of inner planes that get thrown around, the, the basic conceit here is that um, if we think of the planes sort of like uh, an onion, uh, or something that that has an inner core, the uh, the inner planes, and then as you go out, there's the transitive ethereal, then the material astral, and then the outer. And then in the outer planes, you sort of conceive of them as being like a, like a pie, for instance, right, with sort of a crust on top. It's onion pie, got it. Sure, it's an onion pie and a, an uncooked onion pie, <laughs> and there's like a crust on top. <laughs> <Plain smell. laughs> which is the Outlands, the planes right. of balanced neutrality, the center of which sits uh, Sigil, which is on top of the sort of like a spire. It's a physical place, and the closer you get to the spire, the less like divine power there is, so that if you're sitting at the bottom of it, like gods are just nothing, they have no more divine power, and it's kind of a weird place because it suggests that you can walk an actual physical road around the Outlands to get to a gate town, and a gate town is sort of where... Um, 
you know, there, you, you access the first level of a plane. Mm -hmm. Planescape had all of, the, it really fleshed all this out and really added a lot of terminology and, and like denizens that live in these places. And it sort of like fleshed it out from a world building perspective, but didn't always give you the tools to like run an adventure there. But in terms of just the potential of, of adventure sources and places for conflict, the Great Wheel is like just almost too, <laughs> almost offers too many options. Well, right, you no, have like 16 that. outer planes, the two transitive, all of the inner planes, plus positive and negative energy uh, planes. It's just like so much going on and making it all fit together and make sense is kind of a, a balancing act that mm -hmm. for some just doesn't cut it. Um, and in fourth edition, they tried to, um, you know, try to shake things up and take the elements of the Great Wheel, but but make them into something a bit different. And I didn't like it at the time because I was like diehard Planescape fan. How dare you change everything? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Harumph. Uh, but looking back at it, I'm kind of like, hey, this is kind of cool. Like elemental chaos and and the mixing and blending and re uh, you know rearranging of everything uh, to create the world axis was just. I kind of like it, and I wish they went into it more in the DMG than just the little paragraph that they expand mm -hmm. on it. I, I went to it whenever I was starting my Spelljammer campaign, uh, because I was just thinking like, oh, well, there's certain aspects of this that you can just be a planet, and you can just kind of go what's on what's already there mm -hmm. and use that as a basis. But you're absolutely right. It's it's one of those things where it's just like choice paralysis. Like, right. And I understand <laughs> that, that problem, but... You have to start going like, well, I just need a town on the plane of fire. I just yeah. need a city, sure, sure, you know, sure. in the city of brass, yeah, uh, yeah. or whatever. Because I'm thinking of the couple of Planescape games that we've run. Uh, well, there were, no, there were three because yeah. I played as Abaddon, as Jarek, and then the the one where we used Cipher as the actual rule system. Yes, yeah. But we were playing in the planes, right? Yeah. Um, and I always liked the Great Wheel. I don't know. It, it just the symmetry of it uh -huh. and just the shape. Uh -huh. Made it just easy to remember, yeah. right? You got yeah, the yeah. upper, and you got the lower, and you got the stuff in the middle, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, and the in the elementals at each whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it's just I don't know. I mean, it was like it was easy to to know how to navigate. It's just like how do you navigate it? Sure, <laughs> Which yeah, we're yeah. going to get to here in we'll a second. We'll get to that in a minute. But, but yeah. <laughs> um, so like it was a way of ordering things to kind of like yeah. help make sense of it all, and and yeah. But my characters in those worlds, like I would just imagine, I'm like, well, they're used to this, so like the complete randomness of it, I just would be like, eh, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. But as a player, yeah, it's just like, I, I was ecstatic because it was just like every new place. Yeah. You know, there's just a whole world of, of, of discovery, mm -hmm. but, you know, we'll come back to it later. Yeah. It's fine because yeah. there's a whole universe of discovery. <laughs> well, it really is. It really is like that. And I, that's how I felt. Similarly, it's almost like to run a really good um, game, you might want to just focus, limit your options and focus on a handful of planes. But mm -hmm. you can also do that at this step in the cosmology where, you know, their great wheel is meant to accommodate all of D&D, &D, yeah. right? Like the, the material plane in the great wheel contains every one of our campaign worlds, along with all official settings, all linked through the Phlogiston. You know, that's just the material plane. And then it's the, you know, inner and outer uh, as well. I, I like conceiving of the great wheel a bit more literally and the outer planes are places that have no physicality to them. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, the only way to travel there is through astral projection, or if you do use gate or a portal or something, your physical body is left behind. You, it, it can't go there. There's nothing there for it to interact with. There's nothing there for it to have an adventure with. Mm -hmm. But the rest of you, your subtle body, your soul, can go on and have adventures there. And your soul is a reflection of yourself. And so I wouldn't change anything mechanically. It's just like, yeah, your body's back home. In the same way that when a demon comes here, and you kill it, it just goes back home. Yeah. Similar situation. Uh, so it's not like the Matrix. Like <laughs> no, no, not. No. It might be for like, I don't know, low level uh, scrubs or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Go but, to the outer planes and die and your yeah, body dies home. Right? right. Conversely, like the inner planes are, uh, for, for me, like a roiling mass of primordial essence. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, they are ultra physical you know you leave your soul behind when you go there it, it's it's too, it's sort of like the soul is too, is too advanced of a a thing to to have here and maybe your own body becomes more primitive more rudimentary and depending on how uh how i'm feeling it might you know if you're a you travel to the plane of water you might like devolve into some sort of proto mammal fish uh, or something like that. Or if it's the plane of air, you might break down and like the iron and, and minerals in your body might expand and, and take over. 
Uh, now you don't, the fire is, well, the fire inside you combusts and that's why you're going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, and air is another, is one of those where you might just, you know, it, it's, uh, I don't know how I'd, I'd necessarily do it. It might be another one of those where you're, you're not going to be able to move around. It kind of sucks. So no one's ever been there. So I don't really put that much thought into it. But those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. As, as, as such as they are, so. Yeah, for for <laughs> yeah for my Spelljammer campaign, I just kind of use a loose uh, wheel cosmology. Like, it's all there, yeah. but it's more of just like uh, everything's just stacked. Like, yeah. everything is overlaid on sure. one another. Sure, sure, And it's more of just like a transition uh -huh. from one state to another, and it's not an actual, like... Yeah, physical yeah. journey. Although uh, you can take a physical journey to find a doorway to get to another place. Certainly, certainly. Right? Yeah, yeah. Talking about the transitive planes here in a minute because I like those and I like I, I have an idea for like creating adventures out of your travels through the astral and ethereal planes. But mm -hmm. some other cosmologies that are mentioned, I, I'm a huge fan of Eberron's sort of orrery, planar orrery. And yeah, in yeah. that sense, the planes are planets or, or you know that that physically sort of orbit uh, Eberron. And uh, their proximity to Eberron uh, determines like when, when, and how they're um, influence the place. If there's 13 of them, or something, there's a lot, <laughs> and sort of like keeping track of which ones are where and how they uh, influence things can be a challenge, or it could be just like a simple table that you roll on. Uh, if you don't want to create like an entire uh, celestial calendar uh, <laughs> for your campaign. Um, but this is the one I, I use for No Beyond My, My Land Between Two Rivers uh, uh, and Aquatic Adventures World, where it's the, most of the other planes are planets in a, in a solar system that's gone rogue, <laughs> kind yeah. of. And, um, you know, so something like uh, Hell might be a place that's been mythologized, that has... Uh, mystery and spirituality, all kinds of things in, injected into it, but it's not necessarily a metaphysical place uh, th where evil originates. It, it might be something else, and the denizens there just might be uh, taking advantage of the gullibility of mortals. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I like doing that because it's a science fantasy setting, and I want to blend and mix those uh, elements. And to me, planes are like dimensions. They are places where your higher consciousness goes. If you want to have a physical adventure, you gotta stay on the material plane because that's where material things are. Yeah. And so that's sort of how I conceive of it. Um, it's got that dark, the dark crystal orrery. Since I saw it as a kid, uh, Agrazori is like always loomed large in my mind. And I try to find a way to fit an orrery into any setting or world or whatever I can. And I, I, I enjoy it for just, uh, as an alternative to the Great Wheel. Mm -hmm. I really like it. Uh, you know, the idea of hopping on a wooden rocket ship and traveling to, you know, <laughs> somewhere. You know, the, the plane of rocks is just like a dead moon or something like that. You gotta go really get down under the crust before you find the crystal aliens that live there or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's where you harvest stones. But there's others. There's the world tree, right, where mm -hmm. the various planes hang as fruit uh, on its vines and its roots are gnawed by the chaos dragon that's going to destroy us all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Very Thor. <laughs> right. Uh, here's what I want to use that I have not had a chance to, and it is everything is in one world. And I, there just is a little paragraph in the DMG where it's like, hell is a place in the world. The abyss is probably at the bottom of the ocean. Like, yeah. hell's probably at the center of the earth, and Mount Celestia is right over there, and it's like... that mountain that you can only see half of, yeah. Right, right, and it's difficult to get to Elysium because it's like a really long way away across an ocean that doesn't really have any... There's like nothing there, no place to stop, no... It's an endurance match. Uh, mm -hmm. And so like, I really like that, or maybe heaven isn't ma a mountain, maybe the mountain is allows you to ascend into the sky to the upper atmosphere where heaven actually lives, which is like solified, sol solified, it's a great word. Solified. <laughs> solified. You use solified. To, yeah. to create mass. <laughs> solified cloud castles uh, and the like, where the gold dragons and cloud giants and Empyrean titans live that claim to be gods and, you know, the mortals down below certainly uh, feel it when they deny them rain and the like. Mm. Um, so, it, like, I want to do that one world because I like the idea of, like, yeah, I don't really need magic. If you're determined... You can get there. And, and I have done a campaign where you guys like traveled across a desert. You remember that one where it's like y'all were traveling across a desert with like some uh, nomads mm -hmm. and you got to the city where the dead lived and they were answering people's questions. Yeah. Was it that way you climbed the ziggurat to talk to the celestial eagle who was God and you could look out across all creation? 
Wasn't that your creation campaign? That was no, that was the wizard camp. That was where everybody would started level as a fifteenth level wizard. Oh yeah. <laughs> we were tired of third edition. We're like, we're just gonna start the campaign at fifteenth level wizard. <laughs> you know, if you wanted to talk to God, you had to physically cross this desert and and make your way through a city of souls who were responding to, to people's, you know, requested a seance or a prophecy or something. There were vampires there who had to stay indoors. Uh, you know, because they would be uh, turned to ash by the divine radiance of the celestial eagle. And you could climb the ziggurat of creation and look out and like, from the vantage point, I, as I conceived of it, heaven was just a place that where you were, if you were standing in this place, you would have the perspective of God and therefore would be God. And so the celestial eagle is just a, someone that just never leaves that place. Um, that's how I looked at it. And, you know, you can visit and kind of look. That just was how I conceived of it. It was fun. And I, I thought it was more interesting because, like, otherwise, you're, what are you going to do? Plane shift of Mount Celestia? <laughs> I mean, by the book. By the book, you could, certainly. Uh, but uh, one last thought for this. I, if you combine the one world with the other world concept, like the mirror world, that I think that could be really cool. Because then the one world has its places, but if the other world or the mirror world is supposed to be a dark reflection of it. Like, what's the dark reflection of the abyss? You know, what's the dark reflection of hell if those are places that live in the actual world? So, I like, just like the idea of there being a, a mirrored opposite and, and maybe it's like the abyss is not such a terrible place and it's really those fascists in Mount Celestia that are the problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to look at it for sure. Chapter two of the DMG is really, really good for fleshing these things out, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you should check it out. But yeah, so other things to chat. So about. in a, in uh, however you want to order it, um, there are spells and items and, and rules in the game in okay. order to to move about. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So so what are uh, some things to to remember to keep in mind as you're creating your cosmology? Yeah, uh, with regards to that. So the two big things, when it, the, two, and the two biggest hurdles that I see and, and I felt in my own planar campaigns is just travel and survival. Right. Uh, most of the means of travel to other planes, they're, they're not available to characters until much higher level. Uh, and really in 5th edition, you're limited to two spells that get you there directly and then two other spells that can get you there indirectly. And they're all high level magic, right? Like gate, plane shift, etherealness, and astral projection. Those are all high level spells. and. Mm -hmm. They're not really, you know, that easily accessed. Some of them have weird and, and ex potentially expensive or difficult to acquire material components. You know, that can kind of be difficult to to reconcile. How do I start a low level party when all these the options they would have uh, through spells or this high level? And like those spells are, are neat. They're great. By the time players can cast those spells, you're dealing with a different kind of D and D. Yeah, yeah. Instead, I just there's plenty of like magic items and, uh, and even other things that you can use to uh, facilitate a planar, uh, planar campaign. Couple of those magic items. I mean, obviously the Amulet of the Plains. Amulet of the Plains is a good one and it's sort of the, um, it's, kind of, it, you know, it's portable, you take it with you. It, it's, it doesn't have the limitations of say, uh, like a, a cubic gate, but if I recall, it's it, it isn't it doesn't like work automatically. No, you gotta uh, you, make a save. You gotta make a save, <laughs> and, and it's a you don't you may not arrive where you intend to. You might not arrive on location. Yeah, you might not arri arrive on a whole other plane. You might, like a yeah, random one, like a yeah. random one, including the ones where you can drown or be incinerated or crushed or plane of negative energy where you just cease to be. Cease to be. Yeah. And, so it's dangerous, and, and planar travel is um, that's why I include survival in it because I kind of see as you know as long as we're talking about magic items the first magic item that a potential planeswalker would want to acquire is a necklace of adaptation yeah. because that's one of those magic items that's just it covers sort of an aspect of, of planar survival that spells and other things don't uh, have and in Planescape there was a whole host of planar survival spells spells that you cast as like a reaction to establish a secure habitable bubble yeah. around yourself uh, for a bit or, or you or ones that you know would last all day or something like that so uh, in this list I would put obviously Leoman's tiny hut uh, if you can get one up <laughs> in time or, or somehow uh, are able to you know I don't know I'm not sure how you would do that. Maybe a contingency? If you're that high level, you I could mean, sort of like have yeah, a contingency yeah, if to form around one. I come in contact one. with an environment that is, uh, you know, uh, counterintuitive to my existence. Yeah, yeah. If your contingency for a tiny hut, is there a better one that you... Anyway, I, this is why I don't play Wizards anymore, because it takes too long for me. <laughs> it takes no time to tell me I rage and hit this guy. 
Uh, well, so. you know, it's the best way to survive is right. just kill everything. So we mentioned Cubic Gate. Uh, I mentioned the Amulet of the Plains. Cubic Gate does one of two things. It either takes you to, uh, you know, whichever one of the sides the cube's attuned to, or you can, like, double tap it and then use it as an offensive type match. You can let you can make someone else be plane shifted. And that's what I like about plane shift is that you can do it for yourself, you can do it for somebody else. It's a it's a fun uh, fun little spell. Well, yeah, you just uh, you don't kill them, you just take them to a place that that will kill them. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, eventually. Um, it, so other magic items uh, it's there's not like they're not necessarily in the, in uh, the DMG or statted up, but there's like planar boats. Mm -hmm. that are capable of traveling on the planar rivers that will get you to places like the Styx or uh, for the lower plains. And I think the planar river of the upper plains is like Oceania or something like that, Tethys maybe. And uh, so these are planar rivers. And if you can find them or find the spells and magic that would allow your vessel to transport or sort of like translate onto them, um, that can be a way of, of traveling mm -hmm. the plains. Um, Paladin and Hell had one of those where you're given like a chaos ship by a miracle and it's infested with demons. <laughs> You've got to like, mm -hmm. take control of it yourself. But it's capable of sailing the river Styx, and it'll get you to whichever the fifth layer of hell is, uh, where the adventure takes place. So, um, yeah, those are, uh, you got you got a little, uh, you, you write, you've been taking your Stitchia? infernal notes. Maybe it was Stygia. Well, I mean, it's the fifth. Yeah. Uh, I believe I remember that in Paladin in Hell, uh, <laughs> because we were coming down the stairs at the harbor yeah. when all the white wolves came out and breathed on us and killed us all. Yeah. If I remember if correctly, I, yeah, that's that was, where there were whoever survived there. hopped on the on the boat and got away. Yeah, we didn't even make it to Hell. It was, uh, yeah. That was, well, that was a special moment. That's when I realized that placement of, uh, of, of <laughs> AOE <laughs> generating enemies is important. You can't just have them all attack at once <laughs> with their... <laughs> I mean, you can. You can, I guess. It is theater of the mind. I mean, a, 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 a truly ruthless villain would do that. Yeah, they certainly would. Other places and ways to get around uh, the planes. Uh, the world tree uh, mm -hmm. is, is sort of one of those. The idea is that you can sort of hop along its branches and climb along. Mm -hmm. I think Midgard, uh, the setting, uh, Cobalt Press setting, has something like this where yeah. there's there's monsters on the world tree. There's <laughs> got to deal with like spell casting squirrels and <laughs> things oh, that like that. That would be terrible. <laughs> Because squirrels know all. Uh, uh, and there's also the infinite staircase. The infinite staircase is one uh, big favorite. First of all, it connects to places where where uh, there's creativity. So you can really put it in like some near, there's some exotic and bizarre places if you want. It's an Escher painting of a place. Um, and I like it because you have to hoof it. You know, you, you there's an adventure not just waiting for you at the end, but in the getting there. And what I love about D&D is that it's journey and destination combined. It's, mm -hmm. we have the travel adventure, the good Fellowship of the Ring style epic journey, and then when we get there, we have the site-based adventure, mm -hmm. where we explore the location and along the way, blah, blah, blah. Not to mention all the random encounters, yeah. Not to mention all the fun <laughs> random encounters and NPCs you're gonna meet, and, and just sort of the, the act of exploring and moving about and playing in a world can be very satisfying. And, and I know some people don't like it, they wanna get to the next beat. But I like to meander and, you know, surprise. And uh, <laughs> so you get your resources and your items so that in, you can succeed in the actual adventure. Sure, you can succeed. You can gather information and stuff. And so the Infinite Staircase provides that because you have to walk along this staircase and you have to know which door. So, like, just knowing that you, well, you know, that this back door to an old abandoned theater that, you know, was, you know, the, the patrons uh, by, the, by the king and the other members mm -hmm. of the royal family. Um, and, yeah, it's just an abandoned door. But anyone can step through it. It doesn't require a key. doesn't require a spell. doesn't require anything. You just open this door into a staircase that is suspended in air. Who else is traveling it? Where do you want to go? Mm -hmm. uh, not all places that are creative are particularly safe. Uh, you know, it's yeah, there's a, some pretty creative violence out there. Oh, certainly, so. yeah. The Illithids, especially, you know, do a lot of creative things with flesh and brains and the like. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a fun way. And if you're looking for a framing device for a planar campaign, it's a great one to use because it allows the players to engage with the nature of planar travel on their own terms. Present sort of a you know a flow chart of where the stairs lead to and connect. How long it takes to get there? Is it days, hours, that kind of thing? Um, looks more like a subway map than a, <laughs> you know, than a, a traditional dungeon. And, you know, a little random chart of travelers who are on there. They're including celestials who are there to help and, and you know, repair the staircase and make sure everything's safe. Yeah, everywhere that the door opens is just a little adventure. Um, yeah. Now, in the Tales from the Infinite Staircase, there's an overall sort of 
uh, you know, plot of some kind of like metaphysical virus that's sapping creativity from these places. Uh, but you can just easily have one-off uh, episodic type adventures using mm -hmm. that framing device. Oh yeah, and some great inspiration is to go back to the Matrix, like yeah. the the backdoor hallways. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean like literally, it's that's kind of what it is, uh, except a staircase. Yes. Um, you know, there's the infinite staircase with their doorways, but there's also just random portals. Random just portals like are, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Certainly, right. Like, and and the portals are what. Uh, I think Planescape's biggest sort of contribution to this was, I think, is that any enclosed liminal space, you know, mm -hmm. a, a doorway without a door or a tree branch that's fallen over or whatever, like, any threshold yeah. can potentially be a portal. And maybe it's a matter of timing. And at certain times, uh, this thing just opens up. Maybe it's a matter of having something in your possession. Um, and it could be related thematically to what's beyond the door, or it could be not. Uh, you know, it's really one of those things, it's, it's, both, it's a double-edged sword, this concept mm -hmm. of portals and keys, because it's great, it's so open-ended, you can do whatever you want with it, anything you need, anytime you want mm -hmm. the party to travel somewhere, or have a brief adventure in a fantastic place, they can just like come up with a portal and a key. But also, like, it sometimes can be a, <laughs> a pain to have to come up with a key for a portal on the fly. Yeah, and yeah. especially if you're running a, a game like uh, Planescape, or a portal hopping game where like knowledge of keys and where the portals are is how you get around. It's like, oh man, we gotta get to fire, but we can't get there from here, but we can go from there to Outlands, to the thing, to this, to that, and we'll eventually end up in fire, but it takes like six gates to get through there. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's like the like the Dresden Files with using the Never sure. Never. You yes, know, yeah. I know if this gets me to here in St. Louis, mm -hmm. and then that, that bus station will take me to Hong Kong, which yes. will take me to, yeah, you know. Yeah, and you're just sort of like switching back and forth between yeah. the, these two places, and yeah, I, I love that, and I like anything that, that, that stretches out the journey a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Mostly because it's an opportunity for you to just have some fun, for the players to interact, to showcase some of the world, uh, more opportunities to deliver information to them if they need it. And mm -hmm. like to me, it's the essence of the game. And a lot of times people seem to want to skip past it to the, the location-based yeah. kind of thing. But the getting there is half fun. You just, uh, you know, it's a skill like anything else. Got to run it well. Oh, you know. oh, most definitely, uh, and it's probably because maybe uh, one of the last elements here uh, is maybe you don't have a party member who's a Horizon Walker, oh, which is an right. interesting addition. <laughs> yes, the fact that they can sense these portals, yeah, they sense these these gateways to other planes, yeah, uh, and and not having like needing high level magic to do so. Sure, right? yeah, and being able to sort of like you know, look at them and interact with them. You can imagine that there's sort of counterparts to the Horizon Walker and Wizard, mm -hmm. uh, or, or uh, perhaps even, um, I don't know, I could see maybe bards, a uh, type of bard, like a wanderer, you know, yeah. planar wanderer type. And these are the kinds of campaigns where that kind of character is really valuable, right? Like, you would want to have some way of determining whether random portals are around uh, so that they can use those features and have maybe like a, a list of uh, you know potential keys or something like that. Um, if it were me, honestly, I would go to one of the, I'd go to like Abulifa or one of the other random generators and just like come up with a D100 list of random stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, fresh picked strawberries, a broken pencil, uh, you know, an old feather, <laughs> used hanky, yeah, yeah. <laughs> things like that. Well, yeah, I, 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 a I, feeling I, of a feeling of happiness. That's what I was saying. <laughs> I was know. trying to think of a third thing because it'd be a thing, a time, and a random, uh, either an emotion oh, you can, oh, yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah, so you could easily do like a D one hundred list where it's like every ten you change the theme. So like the first ten is like things you find in the wild. The second ten is like things you find in the home, and then uh -huh. it's like, feels, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. or, uh, you know, are you sleepy, are you cranky, maybe just when you're in those positions, you're just like, yeah, I don't know, give me like the names of seven Disney characters and I'll find a way to make them, yeah. <laughs> make them an effect of this work. I just need something, please. <laughs> you must cross the, the kitchen threshold at lunchtime with a fully cooked meal and an empty stomach, <laughs> yes. and you will end up in the hearth of the, yeah, the yeah, whatever you king. Oh yeah, you will, the, the, the ogre chef. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so you're gonna need to give him that <laughs> meal, otherwise while, yeah. he eats you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you can't keep up, you're, you're next, but yeah, it's a free buffet otherwise. Uh, so I, <laughs> those are the sorts of hurdles that I ran across when I was trying to run uh, planar adventures, and like, mm -hmm. I, I, having a character like a Horizon Walker would have been uh, good, or would have been handy, because you have an excuse to kind of like pass the information about how to get around here yeah, yeah. to that character. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, you're gonna have to like, take all these inspirational elements and, and like, 
construct an adventure out of them. Yeah, you're going to have to actually run the game. So what's your advice for doing that? Like to put all these elements in just the right place so you don't overwhelm your players with choice, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you incentivize them to go explore the absolute unknown. I treat it as the planes are there to facilitate a fantastic adventure and not like they're not there to like be reflective of anything other than that. And I think sometimes, especially as world builders and, and, we, and we get locked into uh, DM as world builder mindsets and then we play from that place, we forget that like we need to switch from DM as world builder to DM as game facilitator in those moments. And we, you can prep for that you know, as, by making sure that your place has uh, gameable elements to interact with. Are there NPCs <laughs> for the party to, members to talk to? Are there identifiable places that, uh, that they can go to seek information, to seek resources, to have a bit of respite or, or, or a home base, as it were? Um, a, what sort of dangers, problems, issues uh, are in a location that you would both associate with it so that it highlights the sense of place for the planar location you're using, but also like gives the party something to do? And in my opinion, this is one of the things about the Planescape uh, products, at least is how I remember them. They had a lot of great inspirational material for like what's there and, and like this NPC and this uh, you know, location or, or this sort of thing. And they'd have adventure ideas, but there wasn't sort of the tools for like, say, I'd contrast it with, say, Ravnica. And Ravnica is like, here are your guilds. All right, here's the missions you can go on. Here's allies you might have. Here are the enemies you'll encounter. And having it broken down, not like pros, right? Where it's like, it's fun to read, inspirational, mm-hmm. not terribly useful at the table. Yeah, that's a con. Yeah. That's, <laughs> it's, <Sorry>. uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like, that's what I want. I, 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 I Give me all the inspirational material you want, but if I've got to sit down and make my own tables, if I've got to sit down and like map out my own starting town and ma- make my own little delves, you know, little one-shot kind of places that the players can sort of pick and choose from, or if I've got to like sit down and go, okay, here are my NPCs, here are their plots, here's how the players can get involved on this conspiracy, this investigation, this interaction. A lot of times I do both, you know, sandbox and investigation. Mm-hmm. And that's what I prefer out of, a, out of any kind of game product. And if you're going to have to make those things yourself in a lot of these cases. Yeah. And the DMG is inspirational. It'll tell you what's on the plane of fire. It'll tell you all about the city of brass. Well, not all about it. It'll mention it. You can go online and find out about the city of brass, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to come up with a table of rep, you know, citizens for the city of brass, mm-hmm. you know, D 50, uh, uh, fire genies, you know, with their, <laughs> well, I was going to say, but, uh, also go to the monster man- monster manual because, you know, they have some entries there for the, the so denizens of these planes yeah, that yeah, can yeah. help facilitate some of that. They can know? help facilitate some of that, but you would want to pair, uh, pair it down. You know, the the thing with D and D that I don't think D and D does a good job of communicating, is that it is a toolbox that uh, that is offering you all the tools, and then you parse it down to something that's manageable, something that fits your group, your table, your play style. We don't care about these kinds of creatures, so we're never going to have them. I hate dragons. Not going to be in my game. And uh, the whittling down of that is the creation of a campaign world. And so you just apply the same principles that you would to generica fantasia uh, for your uh, traditional you know fantasy setting to you know the outer planes and give the players a place to start give them an obvious place to seek adventure i am going to tailor my game towards the group to the best of my ability but you can always go off the beaten path and find a dungeon and and stick your hole you know stick your head around the hole and poke around yeah. you know uh, what you know like <laughs> Didn't mean for that to be as dirty as it came from. Well, uh, <laughs> certainly glorious. Listen, yeah. um, <laughs> so it's a, it, that's just, think about it that way. So let's take a, you know, um, a plane that, that can maybe be difficult to, to sort of consider, like uh, Asgard, the, the plane of uh, sort of situated to, um, just to the, uh, just above limbo, I guess you'd call it. It's chaotic, good, with, with just a bit of like, carelessness and recklessness Mm -hmm. uh it's and it's like a really good uh outer plane to set an adventure in because it's generally um because it's in the upper planes it's not like a total literal hellhole and (laughs) it's also uh, a wild place though 
And so you can have like giants and Valkyries and, and the honored dead and, you know, uh, feasting uh, Vikings and all sorts of things. And, and, and you can draw upon the real world cosmologies that D&D uses. You can make up your own. You can look at, say, uh, the way Pathfinder has changed uh, mm -hmm. you know, their cosmology and so like mixing it with that. Magic the Gathering is another great place for inspiration. The Marvel Universe. Is Marvel it? Universe I mean, is another. Right listen, there. listen, like the Kirby's, uh, the Kirby-esque uh, like sort of just celestials are total space gods mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, in mind. And the way that they used to draw the Asgardians as well uh, is another one of those like those don't, I mean they kind of look like Vikings, they also look like space aliens. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, the, anything like Kirby uh, I think is a great fodder for um, for this sort of thing, not just, but he's especially good for it. It's a matter of having to like take the principles, of what you would use to make a game or an adventure in your home world, your material world, and just sort of transferring it there. The difficulty is there's less resources, less examples. You know, a lot of the monsters are like, you know, they're tougher, you know, especially if you're going towards the lower planes. There's usually not like an intermediate <laughs> fiend, that like a CR1 or 2 uh, fiend all the time. There, a lot of times there's just a jump from the scrubs, the dretches, the mains, and the like, up to the uh, sort of rank and file. And so, the, I don't know, use orcs, goblins, hobgoblins. Mm -hmm. uh, these places are inhabited by trolls and, and all manner of things. If you're going like traditional D&D, all of those creatures in the monster manual, like their deities live out here. These, and a lot of them are, things are probably from here, mm -hmm. you know, and then they make their way to the material plane. So maybe trolls on, you know, one of the hell, layers of hell or something have, you know, they're even you know, more badass, you know, they, they have something they're, else going on. Yeah, and they're immune to fire. <laughs> and they're immune to fire. That's sort of how I would go. You know, what does it look like for, uh, you know, a dragon that lives on one of these planes? How, how would that look like? Is it a proper dragon that's been warped and twisted, or is it something else you're just using the dragon stats for? Yeah, yeah. Um, Fiendish Drake or a fairy drake. A fairy drake, something like that, yeah. yeah. Like, what, kind, what are the NPCs in a place like, uh, you know, Hell want? You know, like, do they live there? Is this just their place? You know, do you, do you have to worry about that kind of thing of sort of like the quotidian day-to-day -day sort of concerns or mm -hmm. are they all magical, fiendish sort of creatures waiting to, uh, you know, take your soul? I think there's merits to both. Yeah, yeah. I like treating these places like they're more real than they seem to suggest. You know, the, mm -hmm. the people here, they are people, they have material needs, they can go to a place like Dis and if you're savvy, can make it there. Yeah. Uh, it's just getting there sucks, and your neighbors are not particularly nice. Well, I mean, you still have to deal with the day-to-day, -day, but all those fiends have to get the chains <laughs> they used to chain up their victims somewhere. Right. And, you know, I'm over here with the blacksmith making chains. I mean, yes, yeah. you know. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, so for, for mine, I treat Dis as, I take inspiration from Dis from Blade Runner. And to me, Dis is like an iron metropolis that sits between Avernus and the second layer. It's sort of like the gateway into hell. And Avernus is the just the crappy front door. Like it, it's the, it's kind of the way it is. It's presented in, in baseline D and D. Uh, just um, more reckless, more lawless. Yeah. Uh, and like, and Dis is the sort of just teeming sort of like uh, steampunk London, but Blade Runner, but hell. Mm -hmm. Metropolis with like Coke Town and you know the <laughs> the docks. Where, that's where uh, there's a big bureaucracy though. Oh, there's that's a where... big bureaucracy, and yeah, and I also uh, it's also Brazil is a great inspiration yeah. uh, for hell uh, in, in that particular sense. So you there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of like getting licenses mm -hmm. and per permits and greasing palms and the like. And I would set up structures for play there. I would create a table or, or some kind of thing to of just like secrets that NPCs I didn't plan for might potentially have. Like, secrets are going to be a big deal. And a lot of the things with these planes, especially the outer planes, because you've got, like, they're about ideas, uh, you can do fun things with themes and, and the like. You can mm -hmm. encourage certain behaviors, uh, reward them with inspiration for acting in accordance with the plane, uh, if that's what they want. So it's a lot of fun things. And, like, send them out. Send your characters out there, I don't know, third or fourth level. Like, it's fine. They'll be okay. Yeah, you know, you control the world, so like, don't put them in a place where they're gonna die if you don't want them to die. So like, that's kind of a thing that you, the DMs can. Do. I, I don't get like, I see you see it. So I can't send my players to there, first or second level. Like, sure you can. Just don't send them to the part that's gonna kill them. Yeah, don't send them to the throne room <laughs> of the fucking Earth King. Right. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> uh, you know. So uh, yeah, it, it is a balancing act, uh, being you know fidelity to the uh, the fictional place, and then you know what your game needs. But in those balancing acts, I usually tend to favor what's mm -hmm. going to make for a good game and you know like not in immediately dying 
it's generally going to make for a good game. Yeah, just good <laughs> plain fun. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. WebDM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week, and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. Supposedly this wizard attuned one fort to every plane. Yeah. So you only need this one fort. Right. And, you know, because it doesn't say it's expended. Right, it doesn't, yeah. You know. Or, yeah. So, yeah, that, Easily would, put that, that would be an interesting plane in, uh, plane escape adventure. Yes, you know it's the key ring. It's mm -hmm. the key ring. You know, you, you find it. It looks like a bunch of Allen wrenches. Yeah, yeah. You know, find me the fork tuna. The key master. So, yeah, this master of the universe has that little thing and like plays the. That's like a keys. big cosmic. The cosmic flute. key. The cosmic key. Yeah, it's like but an the, accordion flute. Thing. Yeah, but then I remember the key master from Matrix, Matrix had another. Yeah, Matrix Reloaded also had a similar. Oh, he just he could open any door, he could open any back door uh, in the Matrix. Yeah, which is just another cosmology. It you is. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, I mean, here's another. They're one. basically like, in purgatory down in Zion, reliving the same thing yeah, really, over yeah. and over. Yeah, they're in recursive. Uh, because they refuse to accept heaven. Yeah, they're in a recursive loop because they refuse to accept heaven. And that's the Gnostic. I mean, that's why it's a Gnostic uh, mm -hmm. thing because... Uh, we can talk about that, totally. I mean, who made these places and whether or not they are good or pleasant to be in is a and serious God's question. God's an asshole in that. But, I mean, this is, why, <laughs> this is ultimately why in The Land Between Two Rivers, the real villain of all of it is me. And that is why... There are three NPCs in the world who have broken the fourth wall. They know they are in a game. Drove one of them insane. Another one became a villain. And another one just is happy to not, you know, is, is content. He's is like, fine. He's like Deadpool. And we speak to each other occasionally. <laughs> well, he speaks to me through DM prep is uh, how it works. But, you know, that's the ultimate villain. And uh, the time travel thing is just a justification for uh, retroactively changing a whole bunch of shit in all my campaign worlds and all that kind of stuff. It's all, anytime I make a change in the world, I put a location in the game tied to some kind of relic or artifact that represents that change that the, game, the players can then like interact with. And so like if they wanted to bring back dwarves, there's a place they can go in the world to bring back dwarves. Yeah. Dwarfs, so I like I do. That's how I. No one's figured it out yet. It's fine though. I mean, they may never. That's the delicious part of being a DM is to have secrets that never get revealed. I don't think a lot of people can handle that. <laughs>